I was thinking, as I stand up here and I was noticing all of us singing victory in Jesus. I thought, I wish we had a mirror up here where everybody could see themselves as they're singing victory. <laughs> uh, it would uh, be an education for us, I think. And, uh, anyway, glad you're here. Glad you have victory this morning. And um, uh, for sure, it's in Jesus. So. Anybody got a testimony right quick while we're waiting on others to get in here? What an opportunity you just missed. Okay. Acts chapter 8 verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same verse, preached to them Jesus. We've got a message this morning, a character study of Philip the deacon evangelist. If you were to ask me why I'm preaching this text this morning, my answer would be, other than the fact that the Holy Spirit impressed it up on me, I have no idea, all right? Uh, it's a text I've never preached before in 60 years of preaching or 50 years of preaching. I've never preached it before. I preached, uh, you know, chapter 8, uh, where Philip uh, wins the Ethiopian uh, unit to the Lord, but I've never really preached this, and uh, Usually I start preparing my messages for Sunday on Thursday morning after uh, the Wednesday night service. And I got up Thursday morning early and I was praying about, Lord, what would you have me to preach? And all he gave me was Philip. And uh, I was so busy Thursday, I had to take Lois to two different doctor's appointments, one up at Hobart, the other back in Muskogee and so forth, and didn't have a chance to really develop it. And... Um, by the time we got uh, everything done, got back and got uh, everything done, we had to get done. It was time for bed. and uh, So I got up early Friday morning and I was praying about what was the Lord had me to preach. And all he gave me was Philip. And uh, I uh, got up at 2, went in, I sat down in my recliner, went to put my socks on. The next thing I know it was 6.15. <laughs> I, I, was, uh, I leaned back too far to put my socks on there. And uh, uh Went out like a light, so to speak, there. And anyway, by the time I woke up, I had to chop out. I wanted to get the mower and everything loaded before Lois uh, uh, got up. And then after we got it loaded, fixed preference for her, came down and did the mowing and so forth. And uh, then went back and uh, uh, made a visit and um, a couple of visits, actually. And um, uh, well, I know it again, it's, it's, it's bedtime. And so... Uh, uh, I woke up, Lois, actually Lois said about, I woke up about, uh, it's, uh, well I looked at the clock and it was 1.50 I think, and about that time Lois says, are you awake? And I said, yeah, and uh, we both got up for a little bit and we went back to bed and I thought, now am I going to stay up or am I going to go to bed? And uh, I thought about it and I said, well, I'm going to go back to bed. The moment Lois goes to sleep, I'm going to get up, so she was asleep five minutes and I got back up about uh I guess it's about a quarter after two, and uh, we worked on this message until really other than to stop for the fiction preface until almost 2.30 uh, Saturday afternoon, and then I went to print it, couldn't get my printer to work, and um, I had shut it down, I mean I closed the computer down, then I couldn't get the message back up. I went everywhere. I finally called Tim and I said, man, I've worked on this mess for eight hours and now then I can't pull it up. And um, uh, anyhow, finally got it back up again and got up this morning and um, uh, at, um, I don't know what time it was, about two this morning I got up and it's going to just go over this. Went in there and sat down and um, uh, just, Lord, just began to run some other things through my mind, not not to change the message, but actually to give me a message for tonight. And uh, But I was sitting there saying, well, Lord, I can work on that this afternoon. <laughs> right now I need to work on this this morning. And uh, so anyway, uh, uh, I don't know uh, just exactly, or when I was preparing the message, I had no idea why God had me preach this. Uh, and nobody in mind whatsoever. And uh, But after studying it, well, I find there's, 
several things there that he could be speaking to me about. I trust there's something there he can speak to you about. And um, by uh, uh, so kind of with this introduction, let's look at uh, Philip. Uh, actually, there's three Philips in the New Testament. We've got uh, two in the Gospels. We've got one in Acts here. Um, if you look in Matthew chapter 10, verse 3, or John 1, 42, or uh, John 6, 5, or John 12, 21, or John 14, 18, um, uh, we have Philip the Apostle. And um, uh, then uh, if you look in Matthew 14, 3 and Mark 6, 7, Luke 3, 19, 1, 19, 1 and 19, we have Philip, the brother of Herod. Uh, neither one of them is who I want to talk about this morning. If you turn to uh, uh, Acts, the sixth chapter, uh, we are introduced to Philip, who is often referred to in modern times as uh, the deacon. He's never called that in the uh, New Testament. Um, uh, he is called an evangelist by Luke over in chapter 21, uh, but uh, we have no record where he was ever ordained. He was not an apostle. He was not a ordained preacher. He was not a, uh, as we said, we have no record where he was ever um, uh, ordained into the ministry or uh, anything. Um, uh, but we're introduced to him in chapter 6, verse 5, as one of the seven. Actually, he's called one of the seven in Acts 21. But here in, in Acts chapter 6, uh, there's a problem arose in the church. It's now made up of a lot of uh, Grecian uh, Jews, uh, as well as Hellenistic, uh, or Hellenistic Jews, as well as uh, uh, Judea Jews, uh, and there's a complaint that the Hellenistic Jews aren't getting uh, uh, a fair share of that which is being, uh, remember everybody brought everything together and um, uh, there and um, uh, everybody was taken care of. Anyway, they came to Peter. Peter said to them, um, pick you out seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost. And wisdom. And uh, when we think about the character of Philip, the deacon, the evangelist, uh, uh, then uh, the, the first uh, uh, sense of a characteristic of Stephen was, or of, uh, of uh, Philip was, that he is uh, a man who both appears to the Jews and the Gentiles are to the uh, Judean Jews and the Hellenistic Jews uh, and uh, as a man who is honest. Uh, he is also uh, uh, characterized by them or at least they see in him an individual who is full of the Holy Spirit. Every child of God has the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit don't have all of everybody that has the Holy Spirit. Uh, in other words, we're only as full of the Holy Spirit as we're empty of self. And since all of us are not totally empty of ourselves, uh, all of us are not totally full of the Holy Spirit, though we do have the Holy Spirit living within us, ready to work in and through and empower us to whatever degree we allow him to. Uh, and uh, I've often uh, illustrated that, uh, you know, uh, if I was to invite you to come in my home, uh, uh, you hopefully would feel free to come to my home. If I had to tell you, uh, have a seat, uh, make yourself at home. You would uh, think that means that you can, uh, uh, you know, feel at ease, take a seat, uh, but you wouldn't think for a moment that uh, that means that you can go into the bedroom and look through the dresser drawers and, uh, you know, check to see if you can find a wall safe somewhere or whatever that, let me see if you found one, it'd be empty, but uh, uh, I, I think that's the way it is with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in. And he is at home inside of us to whatever degree we allow him to be. If we just invite him to have a seat, uh, but uh, uh, then that's uh, as far as he really takes liberty. But when we just say, listen, the house is yours. Uh, uh, this house is yours. Lord, you just do whatever you want to do within me. Uh, then uh, uh, I believe we can demonstrate some of the characteristics of a person who is full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and uh, so Philip was an individual who was honest. Um, 
in the eyes of the people, a person who was uh, full of the Holy Ghost and an individual who uh, was characterized by his wisdom. Uh, and um, uh, I found a wonderful way to study God's word is when you read a section of scripture, I was talking to the little girl up at the dentist and she was uh, working on my teeth this week. I said, listen, uh, I encourage you. Uh, I, uh, she, she said that um, she was a Christian, but that she really, uh, she really wasn't as committed she ought to be, that she wants to study the Bible, but she finds herself reading it one or twice a day, uh, in, in, you know, for one or two days, and then she may go a month without reading it and so forth. And I told her, I said, well, listen, number one, set you a daily Bible study and don't let anything else interfere with that. Number two, understand it's better to read five verses uh, uh, and stop and meditate over what you've read as you go throughout the day. Meditate upon it. The psalmist said in Psalms 1 uh, uh, that, you know, blessed is he who meditates uh, in God's word day and night. Uh, and uh, I said it's better to read five verses and then uh, let it feed you down throughout the day as you roll it over in your mind as you meditate upon what it says uh, and gather the truth there than it is to read five chapters uh, and walk out and forget about what you read. Uh, but uh, Philip was an individual uh, who uh, was filled with wisdom because he was filled as we see with the word of God. But characteristic number one of Philip uh, is he was an individual uh, who was of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, and wisdom uh, and uh, again uh, how much we get out of reading uh, uh, Acts the uh, uh, sixth chapter depends upon uh, whether or not we bother to sit down and think about it, meditate upon it, examine ourselves and see uh, which one of those um, applies to us and hopefully all three will. Um, now then, uh, having been introduced to Philip in chapter 6, uh, the last part of chapter 6 and all of chapter 7 is taken up with another deacon. Uh, his name is called Stevens and uh, he is going to be the uh, martyred uh, by the people because they, uh, his preaching really uh, uh, um, angered them and uh, when Paul, who was there, the Apostle Paul, before he became the Apostle Paul, when he was still Saul uh, of Tarsus, uh, he was there holding the coats, uh, agging it on, you might say, and after Stephen's was killed and the Pharisees uh, all approved, uh, approved of it, uh, uh, then Paul began, or Saul began to really terrorize the people and the Bible says there in Acts chapter 8 verses uh, 1, 2, 3 there that uh, uh, and uh, because of the persecution uh, the people scattered uh, they went all throughout uh, Judea there and everywhere they went they went preaching the gospel the apostles stayed there the uh, church went out and they went out proclaiming and one of them that went out proclaiming uh, is uh, Philip here uh, the uh, uh, the uh, one that we refer to as the one of the first deacons uh, and so in uh, uh, there in chapter five, verse in, in verse uh, uh, three, I believe it is verse five there, uh, uh, verse five uh, gives us our text. Verse three there uh, tells us the fact that uh, uh, he went to Samaria. And this gives us another one of Philip's characteristics, uh, something that characterized uh, uh, the type of person Philip was. Um, he went to Samaria. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, well, that means that he was broad minded. That means he wasn't prejudiced uh, against uh, the Samaritan people. That means that uh, uh, he hadn't heard Jesus say to the twelve back in Matthew chapter 10, go not unto the Samaritan, nor unto the Gentile, but to the house of Israel only uh, uh, there uh, uh, Jesus uh, came to the Jews first uh, uh, and told his disciples that however uh, he told them in Matthew chapter 28 go into all the world preach the gospel to every creature uh, it's amazing how we hear the command we want to hear and somehow or another we fail to hear the command we don't want to hear uh, they were well pleased that Jesus said I'm talking about the 12 apostles now they were well pleased when Jesus said don't go to Samaritan we don't 
don't like those guys. They're half breeds up there. Uh, and we certainly don't like the Gentiles. Uh, so, hey, we don't have to go to them. Amen. But when Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, uh, somehow or another that just went over their head uh, as preaching often goes over the head of some of God's people. Uh, and so anyway, Philip uh, wasn't one of those 12. Uh, uh, he didn't hear Jesus say that, uh, uh, but uh, he very possibly heard Jesus say there, uh, go into all the world uh, and with no bias, uh, Philip uh, went to Samaria, and uh, you can read in Acts chapter 8, beginning about, I believe it's right around verse 8 down through uh, uh, 15 there, the success that Philip had. Uh, uh, there uh, many uh, uh, received Christ as a result of his preaching there. Uh, he had, because of his miracles, he cast out demons, healed the sick, and so forth. Uh, he had a very successful ministry there in Samaria, uh, much like Jesus had when he went to Sychar in Samaria there and won the uh, uh, Samaritan woman uh, uh, to the Lord and then through her uh, uh, won the city of Sychar or at least many in Sychar to the Lord. Uh, uh, you would think as a result of Jesus' ministry to Sychar there and when he would have would have dispelled that don't go to the Samaritans or to the Gentiles but again we often hear what we want to hear and uh, uh, obey what we want to obey uh, but praise God Philip uh, uh, he was an individual full of the Holy Ghost he was honest uh, he was a man of wisdom uh, and therefore he laid aside any uh, previous prejudice that he might have had uh, and uh, he is able to go to those that the apostles were not yet going to uh, and, and so characteristic number two and uh, uh, again uh, we might ask ourselves uh, uh, how biased are we you know, sometimes we have absolutely no bias against the blacks, the whites, the red, the browns, uh, but we kind of would rather associate with the less educated than the high educated. And then I'm sure there's some uh, uh, who would rather, uh, uh, you know, minister the high, but they don't really want to get out there in the mud and so forth and, and deal with the uh, uh, less sophisticated or whatever. Uh, uh, the thing is, Jesus came to save to the uttermost, as uh, Travis taught this morning. Uh, and uh, uh, we are to be open to everybody and we ought to be ready to share Christ with as many as uh, the Holy Spirit uh, impresses upon us to witness to. Um, we get in verse 6 through 13 there of chapter 8 and uh, we notice here uh, that uh, Philip um, uh, in preaching there to the Samaritans uh, there uh, it says there in I believe it's about verse 8 he says uh, and they rejoiced. Uh, uh, it was much rejoicing. Psalms 126 says, uh, uh, you know, that uh, he that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, will doubtless come again rejoicing, and bring his sheaves with him. Uh, and uh, uh, a friend, uh, uh, there is joy. I'm confident that each of you, uh, uh, when you got saved, uh, uh, rose up rejoicing in the fact that you got saved. If you did now, you might ought to go back and, uh, and try that one more time. You know, I mean, uh, when Jesus takes away the guilt, when he replaces it with the peace, uh, and when everybody around you is excited because of the fact that you've been saved, hey, there ought to be rejoicing. Amen. Uh, there was in Samaria as a result of, um, of um, Philip's preaching there. Um, uh, but notice uh, uh, very, uh, what uh, they're uh, uh, in. Um, Acts again, uh, uh, chapter 8 there, uh, uh, 6 through uh, uh, 13 there. Uh, we see a third uh, thing, a third characteristic about uh, Philip. That was he was committed, a uh, friend, to his calling. Um, uh, he was faithful to preach, uh, and it really didn't matter where God would call him to preach. Uh, he was faithful in preaching, and, and um, without doubt, um, 
the most, I don't know if we'd say popular, or I'd say the best, uh, the, the, the most uh, um, well-read, we'll put it that way, most preached uh, a section of Acts 8 uh, is in Acts 8, 26 through 40, as uh, uh, Philip goes to preach to the Ethiopian. Uh, and I, I hadn't noticed this before, but uh, I, I was caught by it. Uh, uh, if you read there uh, in about verse 26, 28, now Philip is in Samaria preaching a successful revival. Hundreds are being, uh, well, I don't know how many have been saved, but many were being saved. And it said, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip and said, I want you to go south, down by the way of Gaza down there, by the way of the desert down there. It's interesting, when you get down to verse uh, 29, uh, when Philip gets down there, it says, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And I got to thinking about that. Why, why did an angel speak to him in Samaria? And the Spirit speak to him uh, after he got there. I got to thinking about that. I asked that question kind of to uh, the Lord and to myself there. Uh, what, why angel? And, and I think, you know, uh, either the Holy Spirit gave me the answer or uh, at any rate, uh, Philip is in Samaria, a capital of Samaria, a fairly size city. He is getting people saved. What evangelist wants to walk away from a large crowd of people where he's getting people saved to go to a desert where there's nobody at down there? And I thought maybe, maybe Philip needed to see an angel there. Uh, you know, uh, in the Bible, most of the time when angels came and talked to people, they saw them visibly. Mary saw Gabriel and uh, so forth. Uh, Joseph saw him in a dream there. But uh, the thing is, uh, Philip may have needed a visible sign there, a visible individual, if you would, said, Philip, listen, uh, hey, uh, I'm the angel of the Lord. Uh, uh, this is from the Lord. The Lord wants you to go down to Gaza. And so convinced that it's God's will that he go to Gaza, that he leave the revival uh, and goes to Gaza, Philip obeys. Now then that he's down there and the only thing he sees or the only person he sees, hey, there's a chariot coming over the horizon there. Uh, uh, now then the Holy Spirit can just speak to him in that still small voice. You know, if you go over to First Kings, uh, Elijah, when Elijah's running from Jezebel there and he winds up in a cave way down there, almost uh, down to the Red Sea down, down there and uh, uh, God sends a uh, earthquake and a mighty rushing wind and all of that, but then God speaks to him in a still, small voice. Well, now that God has got uh, Solomon away from the crowd, away from all the excitement, got him down here in the desert, then God can speak to that still small boy. I don't know if that's the situation or not, but it satisfied me. Amen. Uh, if, if you got a, uh, uh, you know, if you don't have another explanation, I like mine better than yours. All right. Uh, but uh, uh, at any rate, when Philip obeys, now then he's where God wants him to be. God can speak to him in that still, small voice and say, Philip, go attach yourself to that character. That's the guy I want you to share the gospel with. And so we see here a, a, a third uh, uh, characteristic of, um, of uh, Philip. Number one, he is honest, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Uh, number uh, uh, two there, he is broad-minded, void of prejudice. Number three there, uh, he was committed to the task wherever God might lead. Uh, and now then, number uh, four, uh, 
he demonstrates a character of obedience. Uh, he is ready to go where God sends him wherever that is uh, and to do what God tells him to do. And uh, he attaches himself there to the uh, uh, chariot there. And um, when uh, we uh, think about that, when I thought about that, the thought came to me. I wonder if I have missed what it was, some command that God had for me. Because there was no visible sign there. I, I praise God when uh, Lois and I got serious about following the Lord. Uh, the Lord gave me a visible sign out in Phoenix. Uh, he showed me that mountain over there that I never had seen before. Uh, uh, and uh, I, he gave us a visible sign through Lois there. She uh, uh, asked this lady to pray. And the lady told her uh, uh, we would be down here in this area there. Uh, uh, but uh, I just wondered, you know, uh, as perhaps God at one time or another uh, tried to get my attention and because I was waiting for the steel small voice uh, because I didn't see the angel I, I failed to hear that steel small voice and uh, uh, you might say well now pastor uh, don't you think that would uh, that you'd recognize an angel if you saw him well I don't know look in Hebrews if you would chapter 13 verse 1 and 2 here in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, uh, the Apostle Paul, is assuming Paul wrote Hebrews, I believe he did. Uh, but anyway, the writer of Hebrews says, Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Just a thought. <laughs> anyway, before we leave Hebrews 13 1, notice verse 1 again. Let brotherly love continue. How many of you are familiar with Jesus carrying his cross up Calvary in Matthew 27 32? Or in Mark 13 21? Or in Luke 23 26? Now, it's easy to remember uh, because in each book it's next to the last chapter. There's 28 chapters in Matthew. This is in the 27th chapter. There's uh, 16 chapters in Mark. This is in the uh, 15th chapter there. And of course there's 24 chapters in Luke. So this is in the 23rd chapter. But notice what each one of them says. And they compelled one Simon of Serene who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And if you look in Matthew chapter 26, verse 38, Mark 14, uh, and verses uh, uh, 34, Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. And he says to his disciples, I am exceeding sorrowful. Pray for me as I go further to pray. I believe as Mark says, and there he uh, pleaded with the Lord there, if possible, let this cup pass from him. In other words, my friend, listen. Carrying his cross up Calvary's hill was such a burden to Jesus until he had to have help carrying it. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't quit? Simply because he was bearing, it was a burden to him. Aren't you glad he didn't quit in spite of the fact that he could have called a 12 legion of angels to set him free? Aren't you glad that the father didn't answer his prayer there that he prayed in the garden three times? Lord, let this cup pass from me. Now, I say this because I've read in other words, carrying his cross of Calvary was a tremendous burden to Jesus. 
but he didn't quit. Now the reason I mentioned this is I was upbraiding someone the other day and I was talking about uh, how faithful they were and, and the expense it was to them. And somebody said, uh, well, if it's such a burden to them, why don't they quit? And fail to realize that what they were doing was something that has to be done every single week. And instead of saying, hey, listen, I see your burden. How can I help? Can I bear this burden with you? My friend, this is exactly what Philip did. Philip is approaching the chariot there. And he hears the he hears the unit reading from Isaiah 53. Uh, and and uh, Philip says to him, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he says, How can I accept someone guides me? Who is this man speaking of? Of himself? Or is he speaking of someone else? And the Bible said, Philip came up into the chariot with him. And in chapter 8, verse 5, uh, he opened, or 35, he opened his mouth. And started with that same verse. That verse there in Isaiah 53. He preached to him Jesus. Now listen. Uh, when we see someone carrying a burden. That needs to be bore. Let's not encourage them to quit. Let's say hey can I help you. With the load. And uh, then help them, help them with the load. A characteristic number four of, of Philip was that uh, a, uh, he was a servant. I've got a neighbor lives next door to me, I, and and you know he's got a lot here. His the, the north lot is, runs against my south lot and uh, our fence. And uh, he lives in Oklahoma City and uh, there's been sickness in his family and he hasn't made it down and the grass is getting about yay high and uh, he came down and I was coming back from town and I, I saw him there. We always wave at each other, he waved at me. I stopped. I said, did you bring your mower? And he said, no, I thought I'd see if I could borrow my neighbors. I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to be cutting my yard in a little bit. Won't I just swing over and I'll get yours? He said, I appreciate that. So I did. And his wife came over and she said to me, uh, thank you for doing that. I said, oh, that's just what Jesus would have done. And uh, then watch the expression on her face. And uh, I said, I just thank the Lord. God's given us a servant heart. We love to help people. But the thing is, we, we, when we see somebody Bearing a load. We were going in town the other day, and there, there is this old fella. He's got, uh, he's got himself as a, a beard there. Only his is solid white, um, and uh, he's pushing his bike up that big hill over there. And Lois well, said, "Look at that poor old man there. We'll just stop and give him a ride." I said, "Honey, where am I going to put his bicycle? <laughs> it won't fit in my trunk here." Uh, uh, but that ought to be in our hearts, a heart of Philip there. A desire, a, a joy in serving. I noticed Philip was able to guide this uh, Ephesian unit in spite of the fact that he was not an apostle, not an ordained preacher. Uh, we have no record that he uh, sat at the feet of Gamaliel as Paul did. Uh, uh, we have no, uh, the Bible doesn't tell us uh, how long he'd been a Christian. Didn't tell us when he got saved. Didn't tell us where he got saved. Very possibly he was one of the 3,000 that came down to worship at Pentecost there and heard Peter preach and got saved. If that's the case, uh, he hasn't been a Christian too terribly long. Uh, but when the persecution comes, uh, in order to get the church to go out, uh, uh, 
Philip went out. And when he had an opportunity to uh, help an individual to guide him through the scriptures, uh, he had a knowledge about the Old Testament. He was able to take that Old Testament verse and bring it all the way through to the New Testament and point to the Ethiopian and say, look, a uh, this is Jesus uh, that Isaiah is talking about. He did it so effectively that uh, the Ethiopian uh, believed and again rejoiced. When I was looking at that back, I don't know, 20, 30, more than 30 years ago, uh, more than 40 years ago, because back before uh, I met Lois and uh, I often, I'll say, man, I had it for 10 years, and then I get to thinking that was before Lois, uh, and uh, I realized, hey, that's 50 years ago. <laughs> you know, but anyway, I memorized Matthew chapter 13, verse 52. It is a key, I friend, to understanding the kingdom of heaven parables. As a matter of fact, if you read Matthew chapter 13, there's seven. Jesus gives seven parables there. Mark says without a parable, uh, uh, he did not teach anything. But there's seven parables there. When Jesus gets through with the seventh one, which is the net uh, cast into the sea, uh, Jesus said to the apostles, Understandest thou these things? And... Uh, they said, yeah, Lord. And, and I, I could just imagine Jesus thinking, sure, sure you do. You guys got it down pat. You won't even remember that I told you about a resurrection here. But anyway, that's verse 51. He asked him if they, and they said, yeah. In verse 52, he says this. Therefore, a scribe of the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man who is a householder who taketh from his treasury things both old and new. In other words, my friend, listen, if you're going to understand the New Testament, you need to know something about the Old Testament. You cannot understand Revelations without Daniel and Zechariah and Joel. Uh, uh, much of the... Uh, New Testament uh, is dependent upon our knowledge of the Old Testament. We have to bring out of the treasure the old if we're going to understand the new. Let me say to you, I've said this before, but it's been a time. There is not one single doctrine taught in the New Testament that is not found in the Old Testament, either in actuality or in type. How can we say that we know the kingdom of heaven if we don't know what Daniel and Zechariah and Joel and Micah and other and Jeremiah and others uh, teach us in the Old Testament? Anyway, back to this. Look at uh, Philip here. As he answers the unit there in verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the same verse, preached to him Jesus. How important it is that we be able to tie the old with the new. Without doubt, Philip not only gave him the plan of salvation, but he taught him the importance of baptism. How I know that. It doesn't say so there. Well, it does. For it says, when they came to water, the unit says, see, here is water. What does hinder me from being baptized? So evidently, Philip laid out the need to be baptized. He laid out the method of being baptized, which is immersion. I'm confident this, this unit was a man of great authority. He commands his chariot to stand still. In other words, he wasn't the chauffeur. He wasn't driving it. 
He was sitting back there reading from Isaiah as his uh, chauffeur there took him out across, took him across the desert there. I'm sure they had uh, uh, kegs of water there to drink. If sprinkling was sufficient, Philip could have baptized him when he got through telling him about it. But it wasn't until he got to a water hole. And there at the Bible says, and they both went down into the water. And they came up. Philip taught him the importance of baptism. He taught him the qualification for being baptized. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Baptism represents a burial. Until you have died to self, you're not a candidate for baptism. But when he tells the unit the, the qualification for baptism, the unit says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. And convinced Philip of it evidently because Philip took him down and baptized him there. And then when Philip, uh, when they came up out of the water, the Bible says, and Philip was taken away and the eunuchs saw him no more. Do you think that one fire, you know, short encounter there sealed it for the, for the Ethiopian? I believe so. Because even though Philip was gone, what a type of the rapture. Though Philip was gone, the Bible says, and the Ethiopian went on his way rejoicing. My friend, he had experienced a reality that lingered with him after the preacher was gone. So, number uh, four, uh, there, Philip was a helper. Number five, he was a student of God's Word. He was able to take the Word of God and tie the old with the new and give the unit uh, a uh, sound faith, if you will. The Bible says there in verse 38 and 39, they both went down into the water and they both came up. The job being completed, Philip is caught away. And the Bible says he went on his way preaching in every city on the way back home. On the way back to Caesarea, his hometown there. Philip was a resident of Caesarea. If you were to turn to Acts chapter 21, we find there in verse 10, what if you back up about uh, a few verses there, Luke is recording when Paul and him came to Jerusalem, I believe it's at the end of his third missionary journey. They come to Caesarea and they abode at Philip, who was one of the seven, home. And in verse 10 says they tarried there many days. Uh, and um, uh, a couple of things we see here about the character of Philip. Number one, he was he was given to hospitality. In Romans chapter 12, verse 10 through 13, Paul is going to lay out about 10 characteristics of a Christian. Real quickly, let me share them with you. I'm afraid to look at the clock, but uh, I'm almost it's down to closing. I'm sorry? It's getting late. Is it getting late? Okay. Real quick. Notice 10 here. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. Distributing in the necessities of saints. Given to hospitality. 
This is another section of scripture that we ought to read and then stop and ask ourselves, how are we doing by uh, these ten things here? Finally, he had a godly household. When Paul's crew uh, arrived there at Philip's house in Caesarea, Luke tells us that, uh, well, he calls him the evangelist. He tells us that he had four daughters, and they were all virgins, and they were all prophets. And um, so not only was he all that we've mentioned, but he kept well his own household. In closing, as I said in the beginning, I'm not excited, or I'm not exactly sure why the Holy Spirit laid this upon my heart, but I studied it. I find here several things, uh, several areas where I need to sharpen my own tools, my spiritual tools. I, I hope uh, we said something to you this morning. Many I would say to anyone listening over the YouTube or anyone here, I mean, listen, if being a child of God doesn't give you genuine joy, then there's something wrong with your understanding of your relationship with Christ. I would encourage you to check out. Did you genuinely repent of your sins? That is, did you acknowledge with a, a humble heart to God that you've sinned? Did you uh, invite Him to come into your heart to be the Lord and Savior of your life, surrender your life to Him? I would say to anyone listening over to YouTube has a bit saved, hey, do those two things. Then get baptized as the union did. Associate yourself with a Bible-believing church. Establish a daily Bible reading. Do these. And I pray the Holy Spirit will guard your heart and your soul from here to eternity. Just let Jesus bring in your life. Father, we thank you for the message. Lord God, if we preached longer than some would like. God, we haven't preached nearly as long as we spent preparing it. Lord, we pray, God, this morning that you would take what was said. And Lord, I pray, speak to each of our hearts. Speak to my heart and help me, God, to review again. And Lord, see where in maybe I need some sharpening up. Just have your way in each heart this morning. We ask you in the perfect name of Jesus. Amen. I stand. While heads are bowed, we would invite each one of you to just invite the Holy Spirit to show you where you're at this morning. I would say that to that to those who are on YouTube this morning. And if there's a need, we encourage you to talk to Jesus about it.